Great. Hello, everybody. My name is David Heiser, and I'm the Director of Student Programs at the Yale Peabody Museum. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to today's Research Spotlight Talk. Uh, this is a series that we started um, about a year ago, where we are featuring the work of graduate students at Yale who are working with Peabody collections or in areas that, in, that are uh, uh, related to our Peabody collection areas. Um, and so uh, the format of today's talk is uh, that our speaker today, Sarah Pickman, will be speaking for about 20 minutes and then we'll open the floor to questions. Um, we'll take uh, quite a few questions um, and you can submit those through the Q&A function, which is generally located at the bottom of your Zoom window. Um, the chat has been disabled, so please do use the Q&A function to communicate um, and ask those questions. And there's a pretty good chance we won't be able to get to every question. Uh, so I, I'll apologize in advance um, for that. Um, and we're going to wrap things up at about 4.45. Uh, and if your question isn't addressed and you do want to get in touch with us at some point, please do. And we can, we can surely get your question uh, to Sarah. Um, so it, we'll just get started. Uh, Sarah Pickman is a sixth year PhD candidate in the History of Science and Medicine program at Yale. She researches the material culture of British and American exploration in the 19th and early 20th centuries with a focus on expeditions to extreme environments, especially the Arctic and Antarctica. And for those of you who are, who are listening or, or on Zoom right now who are in the sort of greater New Haven area, we, we are having our own somewhat extreme environment right now with a pretty sizable amount of snow out there. So we can, uh, we can empathize a bit. Um, her dissertation examines gear developed for these expeditions, as well as how images and descriptions of exploration were used in advertising, literature, and other forms of mass media. And so with that, I'd like to turn the floor over to our speaker today, Sarah Pickman. Sarah, welcome. Great, thank you so much, David. Thank you for that introduction. I'm just going to share my screen. There we go. Can everyone see that? Okay, great. We'll get started. So I want to thank you all for joining me today. And I know because we're on Zoom, we might have folks who are tuning in from different places. But if you're like me and uh, David, as he just mentioned, if you're in the northeastern part of the US, then you've probably got a foot or two of snow outside your window right now. So I think it's appropriate that I wanna start my talk by showing you a few images of ice and snow, but images that come from a much colder place, the North American Arctic. So I'd like to invite you just to sit back and watch and listen for a minute. My purpose in appearing before you today is to give you some account of the Arctic regions, particularly that portion which I have visited. Every person of ordinary observation and intelligence has some appreciation of the beauties and wonders of nature. We are all, except for the hopelessly dull and soulless, affected by the rising sun, the starry heavens, the ocean, the mountains, great rivers and forests. But I am about to take you into scenery and show you sights which will be strange indeed to most of you. Every American, at least every North American, is familiar with winter scenery, wastes of snow, frozen rivers, and lakes. But in our temperate climes, winter does not attain the awful grandeur of the polar regions, in which ice mountains and frozen torrents are perennial, and the solitudes immense, unbroken, awful. Now, what you just watched was the first part of a recreated Magic Lantern show. The images you saw were photos of the Arctic taken by an American artist named William Bradford in the late 1800s and transferred onto glass slides. The words that you heard came from an article that Bradford wrote called Life and Scenery in the Far North in 1885. And what you experienced was something like the experience of thousands of Americans who would have attended one of Bradford's public lectures sitting in a dark auditorium, seeing those very same glass slides projected onto a screen in front of you, and hearing Bradford narrate his Arctic travels alongside the images. Now that you've seen these slides, which are today in the collection of the New Bedford Whaling Museum, you've begun to step into the world of the Magic Lantern. 
Magic lanterns existed before digital projectors, before slide carousels, even before movie projectors. For more than three centuries, magic lanterns were used for entertainment, as teaching aids, and even arguably as political tools. They've even been described as 19th century Netflix. The Yale Peabody Museum has several magic lanterns and many slides made for these devices in its history of science and technology collection. One of the things I've been doing this year as a graduate research associate at the Peabody has been to try to learn more about the fascinating objects in the collection, including these lantern slides and lanterns. So in the next 20 minutes or so, I'll give you a brief introduction to the magic lantern. And I'll start by giving an overview of what magic lanterns are and how they developed. And then I'll focus on the 19th and early 20th centuries when magic lanterns reached the peak of their popularity. I'll wrap up by showing you some examples from the Peabody's collection. And because there's so much more to this, uh, to the set of objects that can be squeezed into 20 minutes, I'll leave you with some further resources to explore. I hope you'll leave with a sense of what these devices are and how integral they were to Western popular culture before the mid 20th century. And even if you're familiar with magic lanterns, I hope you'll ponder why a magic lantern may have ended up in a history of science and technology collection at a natural history museum, and what these devices may be able to tell us about how histories of entertainment and education are intertwined. So let's start with how a magic lantern works. At its most basic, the magic lantern has four components, a concave mirror, a light source, a slide of glass with a transparent image on it, and a projection glass lens. The light source can be anything from a candle to an oil lamp to a gas lamp to an electric bulb. When this light source is illuminated, the light is magnified by the mirror behind it. These concentrated rays of light are then projected through the image on the slide, and the lens magnifies the light passing through the image and projects the image outward onto a wall or a screen. Now, there are many ways to make this technology more complex, which I'll mention briefly later, but this is the basic design, the slide, the light source, the mirror, and the lens. Some of the physical properties that make a magic lantern work have been known in various cultures for thousands of years, from medieval Europe to China to the Islamic world. But it's in early modern Europe that we have the first records of individuals experimenting with projecting images painted onto glass onto walls or other blank surfaces, using an artificial light source and a lens to enlarge the image. The famous Dutch physicist, astronomer, and mathematician Christian Huygens, uh, who was active in the middle of the 17th century, is sometimes described as the inventor of the magic lantern. But many individuals were tinkering with magic lantern type devices at this time, including a Danish mathematician, Thomas Rasmussen Volgensten, who was probably the first individual to use the term lanterna magica, which is Latin for magic lantern. And this was a period in history when many Europeans were interested in the principles of optics, that is the behavior of light. And here we have a 17th century, very early uh, magic lantern type device and a very, very early facsimile of a slide of the god Bacchus, uh, Roman god Bacchus, a little frightening, I think. Um, so this was a period in history when many Europeans were interested in the behavior of light. And it's the same time period when telescopes and microscopes are also being developed, for example. And the earliest incarnations of the magic lantern demonstrated how rays of light behaved when reflected through glass. But while optical instruments, including magic lanterns, as well as telescopes and microscopes, were being used by scholars at the time, they were also bought by many members of the general public who saw them as forms of entertainment. They'd have gatherings with friends and show off projections on a wall or invite people to look through a microscope and see uh, an enlarged image of a plant or an insect. Uh, you might say that people then, as now, like to show off new gadgets, novel technologies, and play around with it with their friends. So this dual use of the magic lantern for both study and fun really goes back to its very origins in the 1600s. But within a few decades, by the early 1700s, the magic lantern acquired a reputation primarily as a device for entertaining people, especially by scaring them. During this time, magicians and conjurers found ways to use the magic lantern to amuse and to scare audiences. One of the most well-known showmen who used magic lanterns in this way was a man named Etienne Gasper Robertson, who created a sensation with his shows in the late 1790s and early 1800s. Robertson used multiple projecting devices to throw ghastly images onto the walls of a room, telling audience members what they were seeing were actually ghosts or demonic spirits, and he uh, combined this with marionettes and other puppetry. He called these shows Phantasmagorie. Robertson had many imitators on both sides of the Atlantic, 
But even though the magic lantern was, by the end of the 18th century, primarily thought of in terms of entertainment, it was still sometimes used to teach students the physics of light. In fact, the famous Yale chemistry professor, Benjamin Silliman, who some of you might have heard of, who was himself a student at Yale in the very late 18th century, recalled in his memoirs that although in his student days, Yale did not have much in the way of equipment for teaching science, because at the time Yale was devoted primarily to teaching theology, it did have some physics equipment, and this included a magic lantern, which Silliman called the wonder of freshmen. The 19th century, though, was the heyday of the magic lantern, and there were a number of technological developments related to magic lanterns that made this possible. First, the kinds of light sources that were used changed. The earliest lanterns were powered by candles or oil lamps, which gave off a fairly weak glow, and this meant that the images on the slides didn't project very far, so the number of people who could watch a slide being projected at any given time together was also quite small. But around 1830, Lantern projectionists began to use a new technique called limelight, and you can see a limelight lamp here on the top. Limelight is produced by burning oxygen and hydrogen together and directing the resulting flame to a pellet of the chemical compound lime, also known as calcium oxide. That's not lime the fruit, lime the chemical co compound. When the lime catches that flame, it produces an intense white light. And many magic lantern projectionists began to use limelight lamps. And limelight was also used to illuminate stages. So if you're familiar with the expression to be in the limelight, meaning to be the center of attention like you're on a stage, that's where that expression originates. In the 1880s, limelight was supplanted by even more car powerful carbon arc lamps, which are down here. There's an example down here at the bottom, which created light by connecting rods made out of carbon, which creates a low voltage electric current. Both uh, limelight and carbon arc lamps allowed magic lanterns to project images with more intensity and at greater distances so that the audiences for watching these projections could become even larger. Besides more powerful lighting, 19th century experimenters also developed other technologies for lanterns. One of these was the use of lanterns with two or sometimes even three light sources and sets of lenses. This meant that while a projectionist was showing one slide through one lens, they could queue up the next slide in another lens and then reveal it at the right moment. They could also use it to create special effects, such as slowly capping one lens while opening another, making it appear as though one image was dissolving into another. And the earliest lantern slides were hand painted, but by around 1820, manufacturers had also mastered the technique of printing images onto glass slides and color could be added in as a final step. The ability to mass print the same images meant that copies of the same slides could be produced in runs of several hundreds or even thousands, which made a huge impact on the lantern's popularity. By the mid 19th century, glass technicians were able to transfer photographic images onto glass plates as well. And these are just some examples of some very popular um, kinds of subject matter for lantern slides. Both of the top two slides are German. Um, Biblical scenes such as Abraham sacrificing Isaac on the left were very popular. Scenes of uh, new trends, new fads like the bicycle. And then um, we also get the photographic images like this image of a uh, Boy Scout troop from about 1910 or so. By the second half of the 19th century, magic lanterns were widely used for entertainment and there were many different kinds of lanterns relying on the same internal technology, but in different sizes or made of different metals or wood to suit all different price points and audiences. Um, so for example, here's a more cheap, uh, in this upper right-hand corner, a more cheaply manufactured uh, metal lantern that was used by a Masonic society in Britain, and then a much more expensive lantern clad with ceramic panels from Germany from the late 19th century. Traveling showmen delighted audiences of all social classes with shows that included playful images and upper and middle class families bought their own small lanterns to use in their own home. There were even toy lanterns that were made specifically for children to use and operate like this one on the left. And those usually had kerosene lamps because uh, kind of unbelievably it was thought that a kerosene lamp was safe for a small child to operate whereas a limelight or carbon arc lamp definitely wasn't. Manufacturers sprung up to meet the growing demand for these lantern slides, again, producing some of their most popular images, both the hand uh, drawn, hand colored ones and photographic ones in runs of several thousands. 
And a professor at the University of Exeter, John Plunkett, has recently found evidence that by the 1840s, many enterprising booksellers, pharmacists, opticians, and stationers in Great Britain would moonlight as magic lantern brokers, and they would rent out lanterns and slides um, to people for a small fee and for a short amount of time, kind of like video rentals. So this gives you a sense of the demand for magic lantern shows either in public or in domestic spaces. And one of the most popular uses of the magic lantern was to illustrate public lectures, the kind of lectures that fell somewhere between entertainment and education. These might be talks put on by traveling scholars or by churches as part of Bible study and by explorers who had returned from expeditions and gave lectures about their new discoveries. Sometimes we can put discoveries in air quotes. During the second half of the 19th century and into the early 20th century, explorers were extremely popular public celebrities. So their lectures about their adventures always drew crowds and explorers often did paid public lectures as a way to make money for future expeditions or to recap the debts from previous expeditions. Arctic explorers arguably had an advantage when it came to giving lectures with magic lantern slides. The historian Russell Potter has written that because the Arctic had been seen by so few people who weren't indigenous to that region, it was really novel and exciting for most Europeans and Americans, but also the dominant colors of the Arctic landscape, white and blue, were very striking on lantern slides. So just to show you one example, these are a few slides with scenes from the British Arctic expedition of 1875 to 1876, uh, sometimes called the Nares expedition. And as you can see, they're quite beautiful and they must have appeared wondrous to people who were sitting in a dark auditorium listening to a lecture about a far off region that they knew very little about. In reality, this particular expedition was kind of a mess. The expedition was cut short. Almost everyone on it got scurvy and the British Parliament even convened an, uh, an inquiry into why the expedition had failed so miserably. But you don't see any of that in the slides. In the world of the Magic Lantern Show, it's all just beautiful and pristine. And here's another set of exploration related slides. These relate to the famous British explorers of Central Africa, Henry Morton Stanley and David Livingston. Magic Lantern lectures about exploration and geography in particular are, are interesting because even as they entertained audiences with stories about adventure, they were teaching audiences about different places on the globe that European countries and the United States were colonizing. So they taught audiences in ways both subtle and not so subtle about colonial spaces, about other groups of people that their governments were ruling over, and particular social values. And this was especially true of men like Livingston and Stanley, who embodied many of the qualities seen as desirable for Victorian men. And I just want to point out this one actually is a complete set of slides uh, detailing the life and work of David Livingston. You can actually see the title on this custom made box that just comes with the set. Each one of the slides is numbered. This one depicts um, Livingston being attacked by a lion, which was an image that was reproduced a lot in British media that showed his, was supposed to show his heroism. This is the famous or infamous meeting between uh, Stanley and Livingston in 1871. But magic lanterns weren't only used for popular entertainment and education. By the late 19th century, many classroom instructors, including in science and medical education, were beginning to use lantern slides to instruct their students. Here, we'll move to looking at objects from the Peabody's collection, as the museum has several lanterns from this time that may have been used as teaching aids. This first one was made by the firm of T.H. McAllister around 1886. Thomas H. McAllister established a scientific supply business in New York City around 1866. He came from a family of scientific instrument makers um, that were based in Philadelphia and he worked there before striking out on his own. He manufactured and sold lanterns and lantern slides, microscope slides and other optical equipment and possibly drew clientele from both the scientific communities and the broader public. In fact, the McAllister firm was well known for its cheap and small compound microscopes. The source of light for this particular lantern is a built-in oil lamp. And here is a second example from the Peabody collection made just a few years later in 1890 by the A.H. Baird Company in Edinburgh, sorry, in Edinburgh, Scotland. Baird was a company that manufactured different optical entertainment devices in the 19th century, including magic lanterns and stereoscopes, which were an early form of 3D photography. The lantern's exterior is made of expensive mahogany, and its light source is a carbon arc lamp, which was made by a different manufacturer, and we know because inside the lamp is stamped Ross, London. And there's a piece of velvet fabric at the back for the projectionist to drape over their head while adjusting the slides. 
Now, even though both of these lanterns are from the 19th century and both are part of the Peabody's History of Science and Technology collection, there's no evidence they were actually used at Yale during this time period. Both of these lanterns were donated to the Peabody much more recently by Thomas Lentz, who is currently Professor Emeritus of Cell Biology at the Yale School of Medicine. However, they're both representative of the kinds of magic lanterns that could have been used in instruction at Yale during this time. Something similar could be said of this magic lantern slide made between 1863 and 1885 that depicts the proboscis of the house fly. That's the plunger-like appendage that extends from the fly's head. This particular slide has a connection to a firm that you may recognize, which is still around today, Bosch and Lom. They're familiar to me personally because they make my contact lenses. Earlier in the company's history, its retail division was known as Bosch Dransfield, and the lantern bears a black and gold circular label that says Bosch Dransfield, Opticians of Rochester, New York. And that Rochester was where the firm operated from 1863 to 1885, so that helps us date this slide. Again, there's no evidence that this particular slide was ever used for teaching at Yale, but it was representative of the kinds of slides that were almost certainly used in scientific instruction at Yale in the late 19th century, especially at the Sheffield Scientific School. The Sheffield was the division of Yale devoted to science and engineering education that was in operation from 1847 until 1956, when its last remaining um, courses and faculty were formally folded into Yale College. The Peabody does have some magic lantern slides in its collection that we know were used in teaching at Yale in the physics department. One example is a set of five slides made around 1920 that show close-up images of objects moving at high speeds based on photographs taken by British physicist Charles Vernon Boys, such as this slide that shows a bullet striking a piece of glass. These slides were made by Newton & Co, an English slide manufacturer and optical equipment manufacturer based in London that eventually became one of the most well-established and successful British slide manufacturing companies. They sold individuals and sets of slides across a huge range of, subject, range of subjects, so many so that at one point in the early 20th century, their paper catalog of products was around 1,200 pages long. The Peabody also has a set of almost 42 slides depicting different kinds of sound waves that we know were used in the physics department. Most of the slides appear to be from a set entitled Foley's Sound Waves. The set was made and sold by the Central Scientific Company of Chicago. And you can see the manufacturer's label on the slide, actually on the outer part of the slide that wouldn't be seen to the viewer. And uh, they were made sometime after 1912 because that was when physics professor Arthur L. Foley of Indiana University published an article in the journal Physical Review about his new technique for photographing acoustic wavefronts. A reprint of this article is folded in the box of, sli of slides that we have in the collection, so it may have actually been sold with the set. Now, slides like these have what seemed to be an obvious educational function, but in some ways they had entertaining qualities as well. Projecting crisp, vivid, visually appealing images may have been one way that an instructor hoped to keep a student's attention on a given topic for longer. In fact, an anonymous Yale student writing in the Yale Literary Review in 1912 complained of a boring geology class that I'm sorry to say on this talk took place at the Peabody Museum. And the author said of this boring class, there were no more magic lantern slides. There was nothing but an abstract, analytical and annihilating discussion of rocks. So because I don't want it to end on an abstract or annihilating note, I wanna conclude by showing you a couple of very entertaining magic lantern slides. Both of these date to the late 19th century and they are relatively recent donations to the Peabody collection, meaning that again, they probably weren't used at Yale at the time, but are representative of the kinds of magic lantern technology that existed and that Yale educators and students would have had access to. So this example, um, which you saw at the very beginning, is made of two painted circular glass plates overlaid on top of each other. The bottom one depicts a man sleeping on his back with his mouth open. Overlaid on top is a second circular uh, glass disc depicting two leaping mice in two different locations. The slides in their wooden frame uh, would be inserted into a lantern and when a projectionist turned the crank, the top slide would rotate, which would project the moving image of the mouse leaping, into the leaping off of the floor and into the man's open mouth. And I'll just show you that with this GIF and I'll use my own computer mouse to show you 
the path of the animal mouse going. So you can see the sleeping man's mouth opening and closing. And then as the projectionist turned the crank, here comes the mouse jumping off of the floor, onto the bed, and into the man's mouth. And you could keep doing that. The slide has the seller's name on the wooden frame, Milliken Lawley, based on the Strand in London. John Milliken, who founded the business around 1856, seems to have originally been a manufacturer of surgical instruments, who probably started selling lantern slides and other optical equipment as a side business. Slides of these mice leaping into sleeping men's mouths seem to have been extremely popular. And you can find many slightly different versions from the 19th century, um, even today on places like eBay uh, and Etsy for sale. And uh, again, just to show you how popular this was, here's an illustration from the graphic, an illustrated weekly British newspaper that shows a group of 15, sorry, 1150 um, poor children who were taken from a charity home by a, by a philanthropic group taken to see a magic lantern show. And the slide that they're actually watching is the man sleeping with mice jumping into his open mouth. And the Peabody has another humorous moving slide similar to this one. Um, this example shows a woman in a blue dress getting bucked off of a donkey when the uh, two slides or two discs are rotated within the slide. And I don't have a GIF of this one in operation, but I do have a GIF of a similar slide, uh, one that works along similar principles in action. So that's kind of what it would have looked like when you had a crank in it that was turned. So what happened to the magic lantern? They were still widely used throughout the 1930s and 1940s, but were eventually supplanted by moving film projectors, slide carousels, and eventually PowerPoint. In, and this is in terms of both their educational and entertainment capacities. But the magic lantern hasn't been completely forgotten. There are a number of scholars and collectors today who keep the memory of this medium and its impact on popular culture alive. And there are a few enthusiasts who even give magic lantern performances, or at least who were giving them pre-COVID. In fact, my own exposure to magic lanterns first came when I was lucky enough to see one of these contemporary magic lantern projections um, in Brooklyn about seven years ago, put on by a group called The Wonder Show. So magic lanterns opened a window into histories of both pedagogy and popular culture from the late 19th, sorry, from the 17th century into the early 20th century, which is a huge time span. Like many of the items in the Peabody's collection, they show that past scientific technologies could be simultaneously instructive, entertaining, playful, educational. And as you know, the Peabody is currently under renovation, but when it reopens, there will be a gallery devoted to historic scientific instruments. And the hope is to include at least some of the lanterns and slides on display, as well as this very special kit that we have in the Peabody collection with materials for making and coloring glass slides from the early 20th century. So thank you so much for listening. And uh, please check the chat for some links uh, and further sources to check out. There's a lot more to learn about magic lanterns than I could squeeze into this 20, 21 minute talk. Thank you so much. Uh, Sarah, fantastic. Uh, that, that was really amazing. Um, I, don't, I don't know if I've ever attended a Peabody talk that was actually quite so humorous, like <laughs> literally like, I, I was I was laughing to myself so many times. I mean, the, between the mouse jumping into the the fellow's mouth, open mouth, and the 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 notion of an annihilatingly boring lecture at the Peabody, you know, which is sad, of course, but it it is a it's a really funny description. You really found found a lot of humor in this. Um, but the the work that you've done to to um, you know, dig up the history of this collection and of the use of these lanterns and lantern slides, uh, obviously much more broadly than, than at Yale is remarkable. So thank you for your work on this. Thank you. Um, yeah, fantastic research. Uh, and also just, you know, the notion of, of the origins of things like limelight. I mean, that's fantastic. You know, my guess is that most most folks on the Zoom call, you know, didn't didn't know that. I didn't know that. That's really interesting to know where that came from. So, uh, so yeah, thank you for a really entertaining and educational lecture, and and visually, uh, you know, really visually arresting as well. So interesting. It's it's um, all slides. I mean, they they're really you know this is what they were designed for. They were meant to be eye catching. So they do a lot. Yeah. Of Yep, yep. So, so um, I have uh, put uh, into the chat, and hopefully people can see those uh, various links that you had sent to me ahead of time. So hopefully folks will get those. 
And I think I'm going to go uh, right to the Q and A because I know we have uh, we have quite a few already. Um, you you kind of answered this already, but I'll I'll ask it anyway. The first question was: Are all of these lanterns in the Peabody Museum collection? And I remember at one point you said, "Now these are in the Peabody collection." So was everything you showed from the Peabody? No, just the things uh, in sort of the last third of the talk. So the Peabody has um, two complete lanterns. There's the Baird lantern, which was the beautiful mahogany one, and the McAllister one that was metal with, looked like it had a set of bellows in the front. So we have those two. Um, we have the two uh, moving slides at the end, the woman being bucked off the donkey and the man um, with the mice leaping into his mouth and the really spectacular one that's got the head of the house fly. And then we have others that um, came from the physics department that are um, in these sort of larger sets. So we have the sound waves, we have um, the objects striking glass at high speed. We've got some astronomical slides as well, um, which have some really interesting history behind them. So we have, we have lots of, we have many more sets of these um, sort of pedagogical glass slides, but we don't have as many of the more humorous or um, entertainment-based slides. Although there are tons and tons of those out there at other museum collections. Okay, very good. Um, I'm getting a message that people can't see uh, what's in the chat. I'm gonna try this again. Um, and uh, we will see if we get, um, we will see if folks can see that now. Um, so hopefully that, uh, hopefully that's now um, appearing in the chat. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, great. So let me go to another question and then we'll, we'll make sure that those references came through in the chat. Um, this is a great question here. Did artists go on the expeditions um, like the British Arctic expedition or were slide paintings made from photos once the explorers returned? That's a great question. It's a, it's a mix of both and it kind of depends on the expedition itself and how much funding they had. So somebody like William Bradford actually um, accompanied uh, sort of scientific ar Arctic expeditions. He also did his own self-funded travel in the Arctic. And so most of the, the images that I showed at the very beginning, and I have to make sure to drop into the chat also the link to, to if you wanna watch the whole video of that Arctic show with the William Bradford slides, it's on YouTube. Hmm. Um, but Bradford uh, took his own photographs, he made sketches, he painted something like the British uh, Arctic expedition had naturalists on board um, who might have um, done their own sketching, sketched uh, different scientific specimens, sketched the ice, the glaciers, but they didn't have a designated artist per se. Um, actually, the the image, I don't know if you can see it, there's a reflection on the glass, but the, the image on the wall behind me is a, a picture, it's an engraving from the Illustrated London News that's from that same expedition, the one wow. in the 1870s, that was made um, it was made for the newspaper, but it was made while the expedition was still in the Arctic. So it was made by an artist kind of speculating about what it, what they must have been doing on the ship. Later in the uh, very early 1900s, you get expeditions, like some of the ones that went to Antarctica, Robert Falcon Scott's British um, Antarctic expedition had a designated photographer. Um, so, but yeah, it was kind of a mix. It sort of depended on how much money the expedition leader had to spend hiring an artist. Got it. Wow, great. Yeah, that 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 stands to reason. Um, that still still rules the day in many ways today, right? In terms of uh, in terms of uh, where where the work happens and and how it can be done. So, um, it's another question about Peabody collections here. Are the uh, well, Romita says thank you um, for organizing this fascinating lecture and giving it, um, and asks, are the magic lantern slides in the Peabody Museum collection cataloged? They are cataloged. So if you go to the Peabody's website, uh, you can look, search in the online catalog. Um, I don't, uh, I don't know how much I'm allowed to say about this. I know some of the the information that's been transcribed into the catalog records um, might have some errors in it, just from people. This this catalog is a bit old, and from transcription errors, people copying paper catalog records into the electronic database. But I will say that the Peabody staff is fantastic. Um, and the curators and collections managers who've been so supportive to me as a graduate research associate are also always happy to answer questions about um, objects from, from people who are interested. So I don't know if there's a way to maybe make a couple links available for folks who have questions about particular objects in the collection. But yeah, you can definitely check them out online. But if you want even more information, it might be best to get in touch with uh, with some of the folks there. All so, right. 
Great. Do, do you know if they, if they are also digitized or, or would it be that they're cataloged so that you can read about them only? No, they're actually, most of them have photographs. Um, okay. Some of the photographs are a little, um, they're um, older photographs. So some of them are not quite as crisp and clean, but the ones that I showed of the, um, the bear lantern, which is the mahogany one, that one's online. The photographs of the lantern making, slide making kit at the very end, those photographs are also online. And I believe all of the sound wave and the um, object striking glass slides are also online. So if you, if you search in the collections database for magic lantern or magic lantern slide, you should be able to see photographs of all of those. Okay. Do you know anything more about the bullet hitting the glass and how that was captured? I don't. I don't know a ton about the actual technology of itself. I know that it was quite, it was quite groundbreaking, as you can imagine. And it was this technique sort of perfected, at least claimed to be perfected by this one physicist, Vernon Boys. Um, but I haven't actually read his paper about how he, how he did that. But it was the okay. early 20th century. So yeah, it was quite amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Someone commented on that too. Um, so here's a sort of speculative one. Um, do you think the uh, this early simulated motion inspired the development of the motion picture camera? I think so. And I've, I've seen some writing from some scholars who've really done like real deep dives into this history who are real media scholars that some of the techniques that were used with magic lanterns, like the dissolving slide or like the yeah. sort of um, optical, the sort of dual disc slides where you would create a different effect by combining one glass disc over another and then moving them around. That those are techniques that inspired early filmmakers. So dissolving one image into another was something that you started to see in early cinema um, in the 19 teens and 20s. And um, it's believed that uh, that's a technique that came from the Magic Lantern show. Very good. Um, so so a, a number of people are, are interested in reaching out to you. And, uh, and I assume that they can they can find you effectively with your first uh, first and last name at first dot last name at yale.edu or something like that. Is that right? Yeah, that that's right. I, there's not that many Pikmans, so um, I'm I'm Googleable. Um, yeah, Yale email address, and I'm also on Twitter at Sarah M Pix P I C K S. Fantastic. Thank tweet, you. Tweet mostly about exploration related stuff. <laughs> Well, that's cool. Uh, someone had actually asked about your own research as well and was hoping to hear a little bit more about that. Um, so uh, I know we're, we, we have kind of limited time on this particular <laughs> talk, but you're, you're certainly welcome to you know address that briefly here if you'd like to talk about your research or people can contact you. Yeah, people can contact me. I ju just like the, the one second uh, explanation is I look at gear that um, Victorian and explorers, mostly British and American explorers used. And that's and I like the ordinary stuff. So I look at preserved food, um, clothing, tents, uh, just the kind of stuff that you would think of now as gear. Nice. Yeah. Um, so yeah, there's a bunch of great questions here, and we're uh, sadly not going to be able to get to all of them. But let me just start asking them here. Um, when lectures using magic lanterns were advertised, did the advertisements seem to highlight the use of the magic lantern as a selling point? Yes, definitely. And sometimes um, with the new visual technology, so you would sometimes see ads for shows that would say limelight show. Mm. And it was clear that it was a magic lantern show, but it was like, this is going to be a show that's like really bright and punchy. Um, yeah. And it was, uh, it was also quite common to see an illustration of the lantern itself. So you mm. could see the lantern to sort of indicate as visual shorthand, this is, you know, you're going to see a, a lantern show. And it, very occasionally you'd also see um, especially in newspaper reports, you'd see illustrations of people watching shows too. So the, the whole experience of watching a show and then also reading about people watching a show and seeing advertisements of people watching a show. Uh, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So someone wants to know um, when was the height of Magic Lantern entertainment slash travel lectures in the 19th century? And did the emerging technology of the kinetoscope and early silent film in the 1890s begin the decline of the Magic Lantern or was its decline much later? Its decline was a little bit later. Um, even into the 1920s and 30s, you still start to, you're still seeing um, lectures, especially these sort of travel and expedition lectures, the more scholarly lectures still illustrated with lantern slides instead of film mm -hmm. because um, it took a while for the cost of film to come down enough such that 
you know, any um, sort of nearly broke explorer just back from an expedition or a university professor who maybe didn't have a huge budget could get their hands on one of these. Um, but one of the links in the chat is to a, a lantern show from 19... 22, I think 23, that the Victoria and Albert Museum restored. And it was a set of slides from an expedition to Mount Everest from the 1920s. And those were original slides that, you know, were taken on dozens and dozens of different lecture dates, uh, even at that late date. Wow, very good. Yeah, I remember you saying that, that they continued through the 20s and 30s, which seems remarkable. Um, yeah, is, and is it uh, is it possible to, um, to to put on magic lantern shows today? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, everything's kind of on hold because of COVID, but there are um, groups, especially like the um, Magic Lantern Society of the UK, there's the US and Canada Magic Lantern Society. And there are some enthusiasts who have um, really kind of made it their passion to restore these lanterns and take them around with authentic slides and do shows. Um, I know there's a there are a few of them that are, should be um, linked in the, in the chat, but yeah, hopefully, one of these days when we're doing some more in-person entertainment again, um, you might even be able to see some of these folks. And if not, a lot of them have recorded their shows and put them on YouTube. No, oh, very good, very good. Um, so a process question, someone wants to know how they transferred pictures onto the slides. Yeah, so that's a, that's a great question. Um, I'm forgetting at the moment the technical term for the transfer technology. It works sort of like a, um, almost like a decal if you think about um, decals in the, Kind of a more contemporary sense. The earliest transfers were tr were transfers of just sort of the outlines of images and they were still hand colored um, to, to be finished. And then the photographic technique, the, the technology for transferring the photographic images onto glass slides is something that didn't come about until the very late 1840s, 1850s. And again, I'm forgetting the technical name for the process, right. but it's a process that originally came from France and then a pair of German brothers in Philadelphia kind of perfected it in introduced it to the US market. Wow, interesting. Yeah, and and yeah, it, it, I assume that in the Peabody's collection are a variety of uh, sort of representative variety of different ways the, the slides were created or, or the images transferred or added to the slides. Absolutely. I should add, there's also one more, um, someone who asked about what's in the cat, what you can see in the catalog. Right. We do have one that I didn't have time to show, but so you've got the, the man who, with the mice jumping into his open mouth as he sleeps. There's another one that works along similar principles, but it's a, a kaleidoscopic images. So both of the glass discs that are embedded in the slide are different, have just like wheels of different color. When you, Ooh. it looks like a kaleidoscope. Wow. So another kind that the Peabody has. Um, and again, I don't, the, there's a still photo of, of it on the Peabody's website in the catalog, but there are videos of similar ones on YouTube actually being operated and it's quite oh. cool to watch. Fantastic. Neat, neat, neat. Um, so why don't we do one more question here? Um, this is from Cynthia who asks, was there resistance to incorporating these visuals into teaching? Mm -hmm. And when did purchase of slides come into teaching budgets? And were they departmentally owned or shared across academic departments? Oh, that's a great question. I wish I, wish I knew what the budget question was, because I'm always interested in <laughs> Like I said, I'm interested in, in people's kit and I'm interested in how much money they had to spend on these things. Yeah. I imagine it just varied by university and by individual professor. Um, a place like Yale, you know, probably had more money than some of the smaller teaching colleges. Although again, science education, even at Yale was um, not the university's main priority for a long time until the late 19th century. Um, you know, the when Benjamin Silliman was around in the early, um, 19th century, the focus was really on theology and on classics. So even scientific education here took a long time to get going. And as to whether people shared things, um, I imagine that would be up to the individual. You know, I, I wish I, I wish I knew. I wish I could. You know, maybe one of the things I'll try to look for is some some physics department purchasing records and see if people. I, I can imagine that even if they were supposed to share them among their classes, there would have been some professors who kind of hogged them, and you know, maybe hid them in a desk drawer or something and <laughs> didn't want yeah. to. Yeah. Yeah. But it's interesting to see, like you showed the box of the Livingston set, um, you know, clearly was made commercially available um, mm -hmm. in the, in the way that, um, you know, microscope slides more recently, uh, sets of microscope slides were produced by, by these, uh, 
you know, biological supply companies and so forth. Um, so it's, and then you think about in, in other cases, teachers or faculty members preparing their own materials, preparing their own microscope slides or their own slides. Um, and now, you know, everyone's a photographer, right? So we can, in a, in a way, have uh, many of our own photographs when, when we teach. Um, but it, uh, it's really fascinating to think about, you know, this other era when, when it was really the, the challenge of getting good visual media and imagery up on a screen in front of a group of students was, was great. And it was uh, a great challenge. And it was really, uh, must have been a tremendous resource to be able to pull from these lantern slides. Yeah, yeah. I think that there was, I think there was a great deal of excitement about the potentials of photography in science education. Um, I imagine there would have been some folks who were quite resistant to it um, mm. just on a personal level, but I, I think, you know, photography is itself, it was itself this kind of new and exciting technology. And right. so photography was used as both um, a way to teach people with the images, but it was, it was itself a kind of pedagogical aid and think, especially if you were interested in optics and thinking about the properties of light and things like that. Right. Oh, very good. Oh, Sarah, thank you so much for this talk. This, uh, it, this was a tremendous afternoon, a really wonderful presentation. Um, and uh, yeah, we, we all thank you for taking the time to, to do this research and put the presentation together. Um, I, I also want to encourage everyone who is on the webinar right now to, um, to check in with our social media accounts, make sure you follow us. Uh, you can even go to our website and uh, there's a there's a box on the front page where you can click connect with us and we'll send you an email when things uh, like this are happening. There is uh, at the end of this month, uh, some some uh, I don't remember the date exactly, but I think the last Thursday in February, we have another graduate student research spotlight talk. Sam Snow, an ornithologist, will be sharing his research on grouse with us. So uh, please join us for that. And, um, and with that, I just want to say to everyone, thank you for being here. Have a wonderful rest of the day. And again, Sarah, thank you so much for a wonderful, wonderful talk. Thank you, David. Thanks for the opportunity. All right. Take care. Everyone.